Thanks everyone for joining us for another weekly COVID-19 update for food security implications in FuseNet monitored and remotely monitored countries. Uh, as normal, we'll be starting with the key messages and then move into the state of known COVID-19 cases. There are also a couple of new vulnerability or risk indices that have come out in July that we wanted to cover during the first part of the briefing. We'll then move into an update on impacts to pastoral livelihoods from COVID-19 and associated restriction measures. And today's countries in focus will be Kenya and Mozambique. As of Sunday, there have been more than 250,000 known cases of COVID-19 in FuseNet's 29 presence in re remotely monitored countries. And at the same time, there have been nearly 8,000 associated uh, deaths from the virus in those same 29 countries. Population level vulnerability to the pandemic and measures to, its, uh, to slow its spread very widely across countries and geographies. And at the same time, the humanitarian and development prioritize, priorities most impacted by the virus also vary by population as well and are not solely uh, limited to food security impacts that we discuss here during these briefings. Livelihood systems remain tested by the ongoing measures to slow the spread of infection in countries monitored by FuseNet. And while many pastorals have begun to find ways to cope with the community and government-led COVID-19 restriction measures, the related impacts on their livelihoods do continue to varying degrees. In West Africa, these impacts come at the same time ongoing conflict across the region from, from the east to the west of the region is impacting pastoral livelihoods. And in East Africa, we're forecasting another poor rainy season to occur over the Horn of Africa at the end of the year as pastoral households continue to meet the impacts of locust spread throughout the region and try to regenerate their livelihoods after very poor seasons in 2016 and 17. Overall, FuseNet estimates that 90 to 100 million people will be in need of humanitarian food assistance across uh, 2020 in the 29 presence and remotely monitored countries we have. We also provide our estimate for 17 additional countries, and we expect that in 2020, across 46 total countries, about 113 million people will be in need of emergency food assistance. Turning to the state of the known COVID-2019 cases across FuseNet's 29 monitored countries, this is the same chart that we've been using for the last several weeks, weeks continuing to indicate an increase in the daily number of COVID-19 cases there in the orange bars across those 29 countries. The sharp increase in blue there, uh, the sharp increase in total deaths uh, associated with COVID-19 continues as well. And the green uh, line uh, across the time series indicates a seven day moving average of total cases in 2020. A couple of weeks ago, we had talked about the sharp increase in the average daily reported cases we had been seeing when we group the average daily reported cases by uh, two week periods. So the first half of the month and the second half of the month, as you, you see indicated along the X axis. We do that grouping because the reporting of cases varies widely across countries and grouping the cases together uh, provides a, a broader overall picture of the, of the direction that the, the situation has taken. And we see a continued increase in the number of case reporting across FuseNet monitored countries as we move into uh, July. And the average daily reported deaths is taking a sharp increase as the sharp increase in daily reporting um, uh, increased several weeks ago. We would continue to stress, however, that these uh, figures that we present on this slide are only of reported cases. And in many instances, uh, it is likely there's an underreporting of cases due to limited uh, testing and testing capacity across these countries, as we'll note uh, when we move into Kenya a little later. As we've discussed throughout these briefings, FuseNet's uh, very much analyzing the impacts of COVID-19 on food security through a livelihood lens. This is the, the lens that we take when we do our broader food security analysis uh, in FuseNet and our projection estimates and is serving well to help facilitate our ability to analyze the impacts COVID-19 is currently and will likely have on uh, households in our monitored areas. 
This infographic here is one that you can find on our COVID-19 page on fuse.net and serves to help illustrate some of the causal pathways that we see uh, the virus itself and the restriction measures brought on uh, by communities and governments to slow the spread of the virus have on how household food security uh, will have on household food security currently and in, into the future. Uh, the three columns that are indicated in this infographic are uh, looking at how households um, access food directly, how households generate cash to purchase food uh, on farm, and then how households generate cash uh, to purchase food from off farm activities. And the impacts the virus has could it have direct effects on access to seed and fertilizer and access to fishing areas. It also has impacts on uh, the ability of households to, to uh, sell livestock or maintain livestock herds or sell cash crops. And then also other uh, direct and indirect impacts on um, non-farm livelihoods such as in urban areas or remittances. Now, while this is the uh, framework that we use for acute food security analysis, there are other frameworks that are uh, being used to communicate the risk of COVID-19, uh, particularly for the greater humanitarian concerns and not necessarily just for uh, food security related concerns. You may recall that the Africa Center for Strategic Studies back in April came out with an index, a composite chart of risk factors or composite index of risk factors uh, for COVID-19. And uh, they did this for, for the whole continent of Africa. The chart on the left is incomplete. Uh, it, goes, it goes down further and you can get that from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies website. But it maps these risk factors that you see along the columns there, public health systems, government transparency, forced displacement. And then as you can see on, on one of the maps that they produced on the right, the density of urban areas and compiles these together somewhat similar to the INFORM index, if you're familiar with that for humanitarian analysis, to identify overall risk totals for uh, the 45 countries they mapped in Africa. And they recently conducted an update to this analysis, pulling out groupings of countries uh, and associated profiles of those grouped countries, uh, both in terms of the vulnerabilities, the structural vulnerabilities that exist in those countries, and the related and associated risk uh, to COVID-19 infection and other vulnerabilities to COVID-19 um, across those group countries. So you can see on the chart on the left, the country groupings that they came up with were gateway countries, complex microcosms, state hubs, clustered cities, fragile states, small restricted countries, small open countries, and low transparency countries. And they've mapped the uh, reported COVID-19 cases for each of those country groupings across uh, the week since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, with the arrival of COVID-19 in, in Egypt in February of this year. And as you can see, when you group those countries, you can start to see some trends that differ among those country groupings than, than other country groupings. And we've pulled out a couple of those country groupings here to illustrate um, how, how those countries can be grouped together to get a sense of the impact that the, that the virus could potentially have uh, on, on countries in, in different ways. And the first one here is the complex microcosms with Nigeria, Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, and Ethiopia being highlighted here as being countries with uh, particular vulnerabilities in governments, fragility, and uh, the size of their urban population and urban population density. And when we look at the countries grouped as complex microcosms in the bottom right, you can see that while they account for 35% of the population in Africa, they only correspond to about 13% of COVID-19 cases and 16% of COVID-19 deaths. If we shift then to another grouping that um, significantly overlaps with FuseNet's presence in remote monitored countries, the clustered cities, fragile states grouping, um, as you can see here, represents more of an average. So the, the purple uh, overlay there over the, the, the blue African median represents something that's closer to average among these countries, still accounting for about 12% of the continent's population 
and 6% of cases and, and deaths. And while this doesn't represent a uh, direct risk to acute food insecurity grouping countries the way that this um, Africa Center for Strategic Studies analysis does, analysis does does help us identify underlying vulnerabilities across countries um, in Africa in this instance uh, that might lead to increased vulnerability and potentially increased risk to COVID-19. Another index that came out in the last couple of weeks comes from the Serga Foundation. Um, this was also reported on more widely across some, some news media outlets um, that you may have seen. And they're looking at the vulnerability uh, different regions within countries uh, might face to health outcomes of COVID-19. They've grouped the, um, the index here, which is again similar to the, the inform index if you're familiar with that in humanitarian space they've grouped the quintiles of, of outcomes to to the five categories you see here from very low to very high and the uh, community vulnerability index outputs on the left map within country so the uh, results here are relative to other regions within the same country and then on the right, they map uh, the same index across countries. So the regions identified, um, the, the region vulnerability identified within countries comparable to the vulnerability in neighboring countries. This is very much a relative index and not an absolute index. Uh, so very high is not uh, necessarily an absolute threshold that's met. It's a, it's a relative threshold that's met, but also um, this, this index provides similar to the uh, previous index, an uh, interesting uh, look at the comparative vulnerability and risk that different um, regions face throughout the continent. This doesn't take the same lens as the analysis that we that we use for food security, but provides additional information to ensure that we're triangulating all uh, structural issues that may exist within countries and lead to, to differing levels of vulnerability to COVID-19. Um, across the, the, the continent um, with these two indices for Africa. Additionally, it helps to highlight that while we do focus at these briefings in these briefings on the food security analysis component, there are many other humanitarian and developmental um, uh, sectors that are implicated by the impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. If we then move and look at the updated impacts that we're seeing on pastoral livelihoods, particularly across West Africa and East Africa, the two geographies that have the greatest proportion of pastoral uh, households and, and livelihoods in FuseNet monitored countries, we do see that the ongoing restriction measures to the pandemic are significantly, in some cases, impacting household pastoral household access to their livelihoods. This, however, remains uh, rather volatile while uh, significant impacts continue um, in, in some areas, they're lifted in, in other areas at the same time, and impacts are not uh, necessarily lasting for long periods of time, as we see, um, for example, in urban areas and with agricultural livelihoods at times. The chart on the left is looking at livestock exports from a major market in Somalia um, for the uh, five-year average of 2015 to 2019 in the gray bars, 2019 trend in the dark blue and the 2020 trend in light blue. And as you can see here, while we have been significantly concerned about livestock exports in Somalia over the last several months, particularly with the cancellation of uh, Hajj, and the associated expected decline in livestock exports, uh, we have seen some upticks and some positive um, advancements in Somalia at times uh, with the increase that you see here between March and April in livestock exports. We have seen also some continued increasing exports um, to Kenya in recent weeks. However, at the same time that we do see uh, these glimmers of good news happening, we do also see some uh, difficult trends uh, manifesting due to the, the ongoing restrictions. And it's very much a, a continued volatile situation uh, in livestock markets and livestock livelihoods. The chart on the right are the goat to millet terms of trade in select markets in Mali with uh, the terms of trade in blue representing April of this year, black representing May uh, of 2020, 
red representing May of last year and gray representing average. And again, here we have it on the aggregate scale, seeing very large disruptions to terms of trade in West Africa uh, for livestock to cereal terms of trade. However, continued disruptions uh, remain in many areas or are popping up at, at times in many areas. Uh, particularly through June and July, we did see uh, some restriction on movement of pastoral uh, households with their herds across the Sahel, and then particular disparity in market access from rural to urban areas with um, pastoral households not able to access urban markets where there's greater demand uh, for, for livestock purchases than, than oftentimes seen in, in rural areas. Additionally, as we move into the transhuman period in West Africa, uh, or excuse me, as we're in the middle of the transhuman period in West Africa, uh, as the rains come in, we are um, expecting to continue to see some volatility in, in market access and movement of, of pastoral herds as they move north, as the rain set in and, and greening of pastures continues to occur over the, the coming months. At the same time, we see these impacts in pastoral areas uh, occur. They're, they're occurring concurrently with other shocks um, uh, across, across particularly West Africa and in East Africa. Conflict is ongoing um, across West Africa. This is a map on the left of the Latapo Gormo region with continuing um, conflict impacting about 30% of pastoral households in, in the, the three affected countries, Mali, Burkina Faso and, and, and Niger. Uh, the, the conflict events here, the security incidents here are noted for, for June of 2020. We're seeing similar um, impacts on, on movements in uh, Nigeria where ongoing herder pastoralist conflict for the last several years continues to impact not only agricultural livelihoods, but also the movement of pastoralists, as well as in the Lake Chad Basin um, where there uh, typically would have been large numbers of pastoralists uh, before the, the ongoing conflict that we've, that we've seen related to Boko Haram in, in that part of the region. And in East Africa, as we noted, uh, during our food assistance outlook brief, we are expecting that a uh, likely La Nina and potential for a negative Indian Ocean dipole will result in below average rainfall across the Horn of Africa during the 2020 DARE season. This is particularly important, not only given the on ongoing COVID-19 restriction uh, measures, but also due to the um, successive droughts that were seen in the region in 2016 and 17 and the ongoing concern for locust infestation. Shifting in our focus to Kenya, Kenya uh, is experiencing more than 10,000 cases of COVID-19, as you can see by the map from uh, IOM on the left here, the largest number of cases in the region. And if you uh, had a chance to read our report on uh, the June outlook for 2020, you would have seen that the caseload up until the end of June uh, had not yet reached 7,000. The number of cases in Kenya has, or excuse me, confirmed reported cases in Kenya has increased dramatically uh, since mid-June uh, of this year due to the increase in availability and, and con conducted tests uh, in country. There was a 71% increase in the number of cases reported in mid-June um, after, after that increase in availability of testing in Kenya. And we have seen um, continued measures by the government and communities in Kenya to slow the spread of, of the virus. Uh, the map on the right also comes from IOM and is, um, is updated as of July 9th, um, just a couple of weeks ago, and shows the uh, border closures in red and the partial closures in orange, as you can see here for uh, Kenya, which, which has a generally very robust economy relative, uh, not only in the region, but also for the continent. There was an expectation for more than a 5% growth in the economy in 2020 before the onset of COVID-19 and the most recent projections from the IMF are now uh, calling for a reduction by about a third of percent in economic growth in 2020. This would be the first reduction in growth uh, for Kenya in the last 27 years. Again, an economy that is generally rather robust in the region. In addition to the economic concerns, uh, there have been recently conducted 
surveys from the National Bureau of Statistics, as well as the Ministry of Health that are indicating a sharp decline in the unemployment rate uh, among many, particularly in urban areas um, due to direct and, and indirect impacts from uh, the COVID-19 um, restriction measures. And we are expecting that those restriction measures will continue to impact household access to, to markets uh, throughout our scenario period um, in 2020. While market purchases continue to, or excuse me, while market prices continue to remain volatile, market availability um, is generally good. And we're expecting that um, only minor volatility in, in market access uh, to impact prices as, as we move forward in the coming months. Looking at our projected food security outcomes through the end of the year and into the first month of 2021, we are expecting that um, impacts from COVID-19 as well as uh, the locust infestation, flooding during the, uh, the long rain season in 2020, as well as conflict in northeastern Kenya will contribute to generally stressed outcomes across much of the country um, and crisis outcomes in um, riverine in, in northeast parts of, of the country. And that's expected to continue throughout the scenario period in January two, 2021. Um, somewhat more difficult to, to see here are the expected impacts that we are seeing through the remainder of the year on urban populations throughout uh, major centers like Nairobi, like Mombasa, um, and, and associated vulnerable po poor populations there. Shifting to Mozambique, relatively fewer cases seen in Mozambique, but as illustrated in the map on the left from the UN resident coordinator, a continue, or excuse me, for the last um, little over a month from June 6th to July 12th, uh, continued uh, progression of the outbreak throughout the country and not only in major urban centers. We do see similar impacts in Mozambique as we are seeing in other countries uh, faced by moderate uh, spread of the COVID-19 uh, virus across countries, uh, particular emphasis on impacts for poor vulnerable population and major urban centers, as well as agricultural households as they're not only um, trying to access their farm and livestock uh, livelihoods, but also trying to access uh, somewhat volatile at times staple food markets. Uh, the price trends we see on the right here are indicate FuseNet's expected price trends in the black dotted line to increase through the end of the year and into early 2021 um, against what we saw in 2016-17 in orange and last year in, um, in, in blue. We do expect that the impacts on um, rural and urban livelihoods will continue uh, to restrict food access for many. However, uh, in Mozambique, in, in many instances, this is not enough to actually change a classification for administrative units. So as you can see here, outside of areas in the south, in Gaza, and in Hambane, in Maputo that were affected by the drought, or in Tete that were affected by uh, poor rainfall in the earlier season, we're not expecting area changes to, to food insecurity phases um, during our scenario period at this time. However, we would note in places like Maputo and urban centers of Maputo, um, we did recently conduct the IPC analysis that did indicate that uh, there were still uh, significant vulnerable populations of 10 to 15 percent that were facing difficulty meeting their basic food needs. And additionally, in Northeast uh, Mozambique and Cabo Delgado, we do expect that the ongoing conflict situation um, there in the Northeast to continue to lead to a restriction of food access for many uh, across, that, across that region. And as we have in the past, uh, we'll end with our most recent COVID-19 infographic. We do expect that 90 to 100 million people in the 29 countries FuseNet monitors in 2020 uh, to face difficulty meeting their basic food needs and face crisis or worse um, outcomes. The associated size of the bubbles indicated in these maps um, helps to highlight the relative severity of those needs across the globe.